Good evening. I'm Frank McLean, Executive and Artistic Director here at the Grand Opera House, and welcome to Um with Frank. This is my weekly opportunity to, in a lighthearted way, let you know everything that's going on at the Grand. Now, the title of our program takes its name from the merciless teasing I get from the technical crew for the number of times I say um or ah. If you've been to a grand production, you know, but for each performance, I typically give a curtain speech without notes that I'm quite proud of. But uh, they're heartless and merciless and tease me about my ums and ahs, which means I should be drinking. And I will start doing that in just a moment. So we have intentionally scheduled this live stream to go out during happy hour because we're going to have a little fun with it. So every time that I say um or ah, we encourage you to get a drink and drink along. So that's two. I just said it twice. Two I sips. Said it eight times. Now, if you're watching a recorded version of this program, you can drink anything you want. And remember, it's always five o'clock somewhere. Before I get started, I'd like to thank all the people that make this happen. Michelle Blanchard, our box office manager and marketing director, who forces me to do this every week, and I'm grateful because I really do enjoy it. Tracy Richardson, our very patient technical director, who such, with such a loving hand guides everyone here at the theater, uh, setting up all of the technical things, and so uh, kindly lets you know when you're doing something not quite correct. Austin McElroy. McElroy, who is our man for all things streaming. Austin is practically living here now. We're doing so much streaming. We love Austin. And we have two camera operators tonight. Yes, that's right. But they're bitter rivals. Bridget Walsworth and Stephen Doby Hall. They're both stage managers for Grand Productions and volunteer almost all their time here. But they fight like cats and dogs whenever they're together. It's really uncomfortable. But we love them both, and I can't choose. But I do have to focus on Stephen right now, because if you're a regular viewer, you know that we've had a running uh, situation here where we have been trying to find Stephen a girlfriend via the medium of this program. And if you tuned in last week, you found out that we did get an application that looked very promising from a woman in Canada, yes, Canada, named Pat. I really thought this was going to work out. But I'm starting to get a little bit leery about Pat. Pat refuses to send a photo of herself. And she has started to ask Stephen to help her out financially. Never a good sign. Pat claims that all of her money is tied up because she's helping a friend she met over the internet, a Nigerian prince. And that has left her destitute. But we're not giving up on Pat. However, I have counseled Stephen to stop sending her money. I just don't want to see Stephen's heart broken. He's very kind-hearted. And if Pat winds up choosing the Nigerian prince over him, there, it's bound to lead to heartbreak. And it's so hard to compete with royalty. Well, in any case, because I don't like to admit to drinking alone, each week I have a very special guest here on Um with Frank. And if you're a regular viewer, you know that I typically drink expired beer from the huge stockpile that was left over when the theater unfortunately closed abruptly in March. But not today. My very special guest, Doug Donald, has generously supplied our beverages. Maybe because he didn't want to drink expired beer. Either way, I'm grateful and welcome, Doug Donald. Thank you. Um. Um. Now, Doug is the director and adapter of our upcoming holiday show, KGOH, The Voice of the Grand, presents Christmas Treasures. We'll be discussing that in detail a little later in the program, but first, the question that's on everyone's mind. Doug, what are we drinking? <laughs> well, we're drinking, because it fits into the theme of the show, a Christmas ale. It's a Scotch ale, uh, high alcohol Doug, content. Doug, I'm going to have to stop you there. You said ah, and oh, anytime either good. one of us does it, and now I repeated it, so that's two drinks. Okay. 
I actually appreciate it when people... At this know. point, there may be a lot of students out there that I've had in the past that I taught public speaking to, and at this minute, they're celebrating Ooh. every time I say, uh, because I rode them so much about doing it, so added pressure. It certainly is. So, Doug, are you a connoisseur of beer? No. No. Well, I'm that's a an snob. Easy oh, a snob, even better. Yes, than a, a connoisseur implies that you have knowledge. <laughs> 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 I just like good beer. Uh, it actually comes out of uh, the first year I did professional summer theater. It was semi-professional. I was at the Ice House Summer Theater, Hannibal, Missouri, block from the Mark Twain home, Ooh. which is how I got into doing Mark Twain. And <clears throat> we performed throughout the whole summer did five shows. Uh, ah. <laughs> it's going to be a good one. It's going to be great. I love it. We're on a good start. So did five shows. And the very wealthy sponsors of the theater, a lawyer in town, would have a party for the company every year, this big party. And you'd walk in their really huge house, feel totally unwelcome immediately. <laughs> because they would cover all of their furniture with plastic, <laughs> and then they would lay carpet runners down on all the floors where you would go. So it was like, it was like oh, okay. Before they let the actors in. <laughs> but they provided food and all this alcohol, which to a college freshman, just out of his freshman year, at his first summer theater experience was like, wow. And there's this huge bar. Well, we were told before we went, don't drink the beer and I liked beer and I'm like no I want to drink the beer and it was like no don't you drink the beer so I drank scotch <laughs> which is what we all did we drank the hard liquor well it turns out the reason for that was they gave us the beer at the end of the evening we got to take oh. it home and there was enough this of it. This is a way of conserving yes, it. Yes, it was enough of it that it got us almost through the summer. But just like I found out later about the alcohol, like the scotch was the cheapest scotch you can get. The rum was the cheapest. So you said you're what, a freshman in college? Or? Yeah. yeah I, no, I'm, we won't go into that. Well, I wouldn't have tried. I, mean, <laughs> I, don't. I didn't know that at scotch, the time. Scotch, hardcore. At the time, core. it was great. Now I recognize it as, yeah, that's the cheapest scotch you can buy. Well, the beer was the cheapest beer you could buy. <laughs> I think it was like either Ham's or it might have been Pabst Blue Ribbon or something. So I spent a whole summer drinking cheap beer. And basically at the end of that experience, I swore when I could do it, I would drink good beer. Well, that's great. I, I so. always think that I'm still an actor at heart because I cannot pass up free food or free alcohol. Oh, yeah. It just it just is not within me. I it would be a physical impossibility for me to go to a party where there ha there's free food and not eat or drink. <laughs> it just it just wouldn't happen. Uh, I however have never I love good beer and I'm greatly appreciative of this, but I'll drink swill, I'll drink anything. Oh. So I really appreciate well, it. If now, it's the only at thing this point I was yeah. going to ask you if you know the rules of what we're doing, but obviously you do because we've been umming and eyeing for a while now, if that was two, I did it on purpose. Uh -huh. Because this is delicious compared to that Bud Light, expired Bud Light I've been drinking. Well, before we discuss Christmas treasures, I'd like to find out more about you. And I know a lot ab about you, but I know you've had a long career in theater and academia as both an actor and a director. Uh, but I want to go way back to the beginning and find out where you're from, what you did, what bit you? What was the theater bug that got you in? I come out of an army back. My dad was a professional army man. Uh, and so I spent my youth traveling from post to post, not really making really close friends. And so I think over the years, theater kind of became that doorway into uh -huh. making friends. But my very first theater experiences was in kindergarten. Ooh. And I, I kind of remember it taking place on an army base, but it's, a lot of it's real faint. And it's in one of those little small stages at the end of a gymnasium okay. that you still see. 
And I was playing the drummer boy in the skit about the drummer boy. Okay. They sing the song. Yeah, based on the song. And so I had my drum and I was playing the drum. And we were in rehearsals like the day before, a couple of days. I don't remember exactly. I was too young to, you know, but. And I was, I was really excited because I think I, that time I'd gotten all my lines or something. You know, it's just a little kid. And it got to where I got to, I got to play the drum and I hauled off and I really hit it. And it broke the drum head. Ooh. And so I faced my first performance disappointment. If this is in rehearsal or in performance? Yeah, in rehearsal. Okay, so. So there's this little kind of, I don't remember, it's The little drummer boy a, without a working yeah. drum. And so there's like a piano in the pit and a percussionist and, because there's other things too they're doing, sure. not just a drummer boy. And so they decided they didn't want to, they couldn't afford a drum head, a new drum head. And they didn't want to decorate another drum because they decorated it to look like the, what drum a poor little boy would be, you know. So I had to mime playing the drum while the guy in the pit played it. So you it played most, air drums. Yeah, it was the most disappointing thing. But now, still, there was something about the audience reaction and just the community, even at that age. And so eventually, uh, I got to where I, I, when we moved, to, finally settled down and moved to Arizona. I did all the shows my junior high did. I did all my high school shows. Well, that's terrific, and so, I want to hear more about that. But because this is, um, oh, with Frank, I love to tell stories about me that remind me. So I have a, not a similar, a sort of similar experience with playing an air instrument. Okay. When I was working for Orlando Opera, I was assistant directing a production of Man of La Mancha. And I would be standing in for the man that would be playing the guitar during Little Bird, Little Bird. Mm-hmm. There's a live guitarist on stage. And we were doing this with the Orlando Symphony Orchestra would be our pit. And so we invited the guy over to watch a rehearsal. And they told him, OK, see that guy up there playing, you know, pretending to play the guitar. That's where you're going to stand and where you'll really play the guitar. And he said, okay, well, where do I put my music stand? (laughs) He says, well, you can't have a music stand. It only has like three chords. He says, I do not memorize. (laughs) It's like, oh. So I got to be in the show as well as being assistant director, and I played my air guitar. So (laughs) not really the same thing as you, but it reminded of me. So so let's go back to your high school and college experience. I got one other one. That year I was at the Ice House, where I learned I wanted to drink good beer. I don't really, I, I, I want to say the show was all wilderness. But during summer theater, as you know, uh, we did five shows and we did them rep, which means you Ooh, did a different yeah. show every night. Well, once you get all the shows open, mm-hmm. you hit that golden spot where you actually get a day <laughs> off, <laughs> right? Yes. The theater goes, we call it going dark. And that means you don't perform on that day. But it's a couple of months before yeah, you get it there. it is. But you're really like, wow. And so it was the show. The one show was, I want to say it was all wilderness, but it was a show I had off. I didn't have to do. But the director found out I had played clarinet. And so he decided he wanted this street, old street guy wandering around in between scenes on the streets of New York playing a clarinet. So I had to do the fifth show and he had this composer write clarinet music, and I learned it, and I memorized it, and I could play it. But he decided that the live clarinet didn't sound quite what he wanted. So he had the composer guy, even though I could play it, he had the composer guy record (laughs) and then manipulate the clarinet sound and I had to play air clarinet. So even though you really could play right. clarinet, you're still And I had clarinet. to give up my fifth show that I had off. Which is much more of a big deal. To, ju- to mime air now, clarinet. Now, you are much more of an expert at this, but Our Wilderness is Eugene O'Neill, right? Yeah, yes. Right. Yeah. Now, I always look, especially right now, I check what shows are coming into public domain. 
and it's either this year or 2021, our wilderness oh. goes into public domain. So, because right now we're with this weird COVID thing, we're looking for yeah. anything else. Now our, our wilderness is not gonna work here at the Grand, but it is in public domain yeah. now or will be in 2021. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, though, don't call me. It's not saying, well, well, yeah. <laughs> we have a very special clarinet. I won't clarinet. play clarinet for you. Wow, <laughs> that's very sad. Let's get back to, we haven't made it, we've only made it up to, like, junior high or something, so give me some more stories. Or you were going somewhere before I rudely interrupted you. No, I just, it, it got involved in this because, to me, and what we miss so much now in, in this COVID is that communal, because theater is so communal. You don't go into it because you're the singular artist and you're really focused on yourself. For me, theater people are so focused on others. I mean, good actors are so much focused on the other actors. Yeah. You know, when you're really into it, you're not thinking, what am I doing? It's like, what are we doing? What's going on between us? I remember that first, I went to Ice House for four years and one year I worked with a guy by the name of Richard Kelton who eventually went on and he played like the leading role, guest role in Kung Fu, the series, and was on the Waltons, was on Gunsmoke. He had just got done doing a John Wayne movie when he came to the Ice House. And it was a small part, but uh, he was still suffering. He had a, his whole shin here was just a big scab and had been torn apart and he had a couple of stitches in it. Because the scene he did with John Wayne, John Wayne had hauled off and kicked him in the shin, which was planned. And you usually wear shin guards underneath your pants for that. Okay. But they were rehearsing, so Richard didn't think he had to wear oh. the shin guards. And John Wayne had assumed he had them on and just hauled off and really kicked him and split his skin open down to the bone. Well, I'm sure it's a great story shin. getting kicked in stitches yeah. by but John Wayne if you're going to get it. It was a perfect moment for me because he talks about John Wayne and he says, at one point, John Wayne rams him up against this wall. And he said, but the whole thing from John Wayne was about Richard. He had run him up against the wall and he had turned to the director and go, can you still see him? And then it'd be like, I'm not pressing too hard so you can't talk, am I? And it was all about Richard for him. That's great. And that, to me, what theater is about, and I think in this COVID, that's what we miss so much, is that communal creation that happens with the cast and the director and the crew and everybody coming together. You're so right. It, you it happens on stage and it happens off stage, and it reminds me of what you just said about growing up in the military and moving around, and makes perfectly sense why you would be drawn to theater, because you make that bond and family so quickly. Yeah. So yeah. even if you're only in a town for a year, I imagine you were able to really connect with people in a way that if you weren't in theater, you, mm -hmm. you would have just been a lonely, sad sack sitting at home. Yeah, it, re it really is kind of like <laughs> a, a family. It is. You know? Every it show is. becomes a family. It really does. You know, and then it goes that next step with the audience, which we don't have now. You know, and that, that's, that, that fact that really, to me, in a movie, as an audience, you observe the movie but you have absolutely no effect on it. You play that movie 20 years from now, it's going to be the movie. Right. When you do a play as an audience, you affect that play, especially in a comedy. But it's that sense also of community with the audience that happens. Absolutely. And, that's and what we're doing a lot it. of wonderful things here virtually like this. We don't have an audience, but here at the Grand, we're trying to with our productions do them both for live audiences and virtual and even if we have a very small live audience it makes all the difference in the world because there's still that direct communication between performer yeah. and audience and one of my favorite things about being artistic director here at the grand is that i watch all the shows i really do i n never get tired of them you know i'm usually sitting in the last row of the balcony and it's just getting to experience uh, that feeling that, okay, are they connecting tonight? How is this different? How is this different? It's like mm -hmm. some people would get bored with the show that I, I, I never do. I never do. It seems like the more I watch something, the more I like it. Yeah. Well, like once again, I went blah, 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 blah. We have to get through <laughs> a lot of thing here. So let's jump forward a little bit in your, let's move past academia uh, and, or your 
high school or where, if any high school, good high school stories, I don't want to miss anything out. But we do have a, the, a summer stock theater in common that I want to talk about. Oh, okay. Because I saw on your resume, you worked at Timberlake Playhouse. Timberlake Playhouse, as did I. I will Carolina. say, um, just so oh, we can direct great. and drink to Timberlake. I must say, you were beating yourself up about it because your students may be watching. But you're very articulate, actually. I <laughs> sat for about five minutes there, and you didn't give me any ums. Oh. And I was dying to take a drink. And I try not to unless there is one. So uh, ah. <laughs> looks like I'm going to have to do all the work. Let's talk about Timberlake. What year were you there? You don't have to say that. What decade? <laughs> 79. I was there in 79. I think so. You were there six years I, th I believe I was there in 86 and but you were a director and yeah I got hired to be the director of the children's theater company they did at that time three children's productions one in the spring they would do it just as school was getting ready to do to get out so they could sell it to the school kids and then they would do one in the middle of the summer and then one in the fall, okay. as school was reestablishing, to sell it again to the schools. And so I was hired to be the director of the children's company for the summer. Good experience? I loved him. That was, I love, yeah. I love being I mean, out in the woods. I like love living in the camp. camp. Did you rehearse out on the pad? Yes. It was just this oh. thing of cement in yeah. the glaring hot sun that you, you'd be out there. Mosquitoes everywhere. Yeah, you, you just rehearsed there because the theater was always, they were building in there. You yeah. You, and no, it was like, it was like was being a, at summer's, like summer camp. Right. I they, was, they had cabins. And you, I was you, an actor, was so if cabin. you weren't in, if you were not actively in rehearsal, you were building a set yeah. or doing something else. Or, or like, as you said, cleaning bathrooms. Right. Uh, one, one day or, I got assigned, because the cabins, they're just cabins. You know, you had to walk yeah. in the middle of the night to the bathroom. So one day I got assigned to clean the men's bathroom, and I spent all day doing yeah. it. It's like, it might have been a job they thought could take half an hour, but... Once I get into that, it was like, okay, now I'm pulling these out. I'm scraping three years of scum off of the little planks you stood in for the showers. But I loved it. It was. It was like, but I can remember I would lie there in the cabin at night, and you could literally see through <laughs> the walls. You'd see like stars up there. To be, and there oh, were no air conditioning, so it must have been brutally hot sometimes, yeah, but I don't I remember mean, that no, part. Yeah, it was it great. Was, I will, because once again, this is... um with Frank tell stories about me my audition for Timberlake was I believe the best or most satisfying audition I've ever had oh, wow. I was the very last person to audition at their Timberlake okay. auditions they had auditioned in Chicago they auditioned mm -hmm. in several places then they have auditions at the Playhouse and I had been living in Florida at the home at the time and I was just home for it and I went to the to Timberlake to audition there and I was the very last person so as soon as I finished auditioning they didn't even let me leave the room they like bent over talked to each other for a couple minutes and said okay we want you to play Joseph in Joseph <laughs> and Will in Oklahoma oh wow and I had played Curly in Oklahoma two times before and I was like so excited to play Will because it's so much more of a fun part. And I go, you haven't even seen me dance and you want me to play Will? That's fine, I'll do it. But like, you never get instant gratification like that. And it was no. so much fun. There you go. In junior high school, if we go back, I played Curly. Okay. You would look at me and go, Curly? But I got cast in Curly, Curly in Oklahoma. But, so. but I love But Oklahoma. no, Timberlake was a great experience. But you'd sometimes you'd do box office. But yeah, I, I had mean, to do box office, but I do remember being friends with the box office manager and just maybe during a break sitting up there with her, I wish I could remember her name, and her playing Les Mis was the brand new thing for the first mm, time. Yeah. The first time I ever heard okay. Les Mis was there. Well, I'm going to have to move on here. Here at Um with Frank, we like to break up the interview with shameless plugs, and I'm going to enlist your help with this. Whenever I point at you like this, mm -hmm. you need to say, 
It's time for shameless plugs. You can say it in any way you want. You're, I know you're a wonderful actor. So no motivation. I don't have any certain motivation or you anything. You get to or... choose how you want to, whether you want to do it like a game show host. Whatever. I'm really yes. interested in how you're going to interpret this line. You're going to do it multiple times throughout the evening. So okay, it's it's it's, it's time, time for, for shameless, shameless plugs. Plug. Okay. Got it. Are you ready? Yes. It's time for shameless plugs. The most dramatic reading of that we've ever had. The Grand Opera House is a 501c3 organization, and now more than ever, we need your support. Please consider donating to the Grand. You can make a one-time or reoccurring donation by visiting the Grand's website, www.thegrandoperahouse.com. So we're going to fast forward a little here, Doug. Now, I, I had this wrong before, but you corrected me. You came to Dubuque in 1979. Many mm -hmm. wonderful things happened after you got here, and I'm going to ask you to tell me about those. So what brought you to Dubuque originally, and tell me some of the wonderful things that's happened after, <laughs> after you got here. I was at Timberlake Playhouse. Oh, okay. Prior to getting here? So you were close. Yes, I was close. That and was a I great got a segue. Call. I could have planned it better. <laughs> I got a call from a friend, Frank Sladek, offering me a directing job with what was a fairly new theater company here in town, Fly by Night, uh, not Fly by Night, <laughs> Five <laughs> Flags Theater Company. <gasps> and he was offering me a directing job. And I had known Frank, we had become friends, we were students in undergraduate school. You're just a baby directing already. Yeah. Is that like your focus early on? Yes, I, I just yeah. love Fissure in control. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he offered me a directing job. And we were, were fairly close friends because we'd gone to undergraduate school together. When I went to graduate school at University of Iowa, I didn't know this, but I walked into directing class on the first day of graduate school and Frank's sitting there. And he had applied and he was starting directing school also. So we went to graduate school together. So he offers me a directing gig. And then I get a second offer in Dubuque to direct for the fine arts players. Because back then they did three shows a year. They did full length shows at that time, not just the one acts. And so I came to Dubuque to direct for them. Five Flags Theater Company was just starting, so they ran into money problems and Frank canceled on me. <laughs> I, get, I went on and directed later for them and acted for them and everything, but that show got canceled. I was still doing the show, uh, Still Life was the name of the show by Bob Cronin, a local playwright, taught okay. at Loris at the time. Did that, on that show, I miraculously made the intelligent decision to cast my future wife. <gasps> I didn't know this, I've never yes. heard this story. No. I love this. So, Lenore Howard uh, cast you her. Said, uh, ah, yes. To Lenore. to Lenore, to Oz. Now that's three. Okay. And I've polished my first one off with that. Oh, geez, Thank you, here. Lenore. So well, I'll say um just to me, um Doug. I'm gonna have to do it. Doug has so graciously also provided us each with our bottle opener. Usually with my cans, I just pop them. But he <laughs> knew that we'd need this, so he got us each one so that we wouldn't have to non-socially distance or touch the same thing. So. I think, how many do I owe you here? A couple. couple. So I cast her. We eventually started going out after the show. We would, at that time, there was a Bob's Big Boy. On the, oh, on uh, Dodge. On the way, yeah, yeah. west of the town. We'd go there. We'd sit and talk and everything, and I would convince her of things. It's going to kill me for telling this. Now, what role was she playing? She was in the show. Yeah, she was playing the leading role. Oh. Uh, I usually and bring napkins out here, and I didn't this time, and now... Oh, I brought my own. <laughs> so special. <laughs> suffer, Frank, suffer. So I, I would sit there, and I would actually convince her. I convinced her one night that it was winter was coming, and I convinced so her that Game she could Thrones. go to winter the lumber yard and rent sand for the winter to put in the back of her car. <laughs> And then at the end of winter, you would return the sand to the lumber yard. And this happened at the big boy. Yeah. Okay, I have a story and so when you're done. so she was all ready to go to the lumber yard the next day to rent sand to put in the back of her car. 
so she could return it at the end of the summer, at the end of the winter, when she didn't need it anymore in the back of her car. This is my big times. boy lie story, because I don't know why it just popped into my head. Because they happen at big boy. We... 24-hour restaurants. In high school, we would always go to the big boy. And I feel so sorry for those poor waitresses, because when they see this group of high school kids coming in, they're going to split the check. But it was 1978 when Pope Paul died, and then Pope John Paul I died again. And I remember being at the big boy, and me and another friend convinced uh, uh, ah, ah, ah. a female friend of ours. That we went to a Catholic school, oh, Wallert, and we had convinced her, I think this was after Pope Paul died, that during the interim between when a pope died and when a new one was elected, you could do anything you wanted and it wasn't <laughs> officially a sin. <laughs> so somehow we got her to buy into that, little knowing that a month later we'd be able to get to do it all again. <laughs> Love that. Love Miss the Big Boy. There are a lot of great stories. The I mean, that's one thing I miss at Dubuque right now is you really don't have that great And it was open all night, restaurant. wasn't it? Yeah. Or maybe I just, I feel like, yeah. Yeah. is there anything open They're all night in Dubuque anymore? No, not anymore. Oh. The milkshakes, the milkshakes <gasps> were great. They give you the the extra in the metal yeah. thing that they did yeah. it in because it was when you finished your we one in the We saw my two class. old guys here talking. Ah, oh, I love the, the big boy. Oh, <laughs> my, the good old days, damn it, yeah. That's what this is all about. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you met Lenore. You must right. have worked out. Yeah, uh, we, we ended up, then we ended up doing a one act for the Dubuque Fine Arts Players I directed. You're not uh, married yet. No, okay. and she was acting in it. At that point, I got a job offer in San Francisco, oh. California. Okay. And so I borrowed money from Frank, because I didn't have enough money to get out there. I borrowed money from him, drove out straight through to interview for the job, interviewed for it. It felt, there was something about it that just felt, it would have been the artistic director for this theater company in San Francisco, which sounds like, why the heck didn't you do it? But like he wanted me to take it right then and there. Oh. And it was like, don't even go back to Iowa. Have them ship your stuff out here. You can live on my houseboat while you find a place to stay, which all sounds so romantic, but there was just something about, can I have some time to think about it? And he wasn't willing to give me that. Oh. There was just something about it. Plus, I'd met Lenore, and there was just my thought in my head like, Eh, there's something there, you know, she's a great lady. And, and so I came back to Dubuque and turned the job down. Found out later, though, that if I'd asked her to go to California with me, she would have gone. Oh. <laughs> but I stayed here because of her. And it's all we had. And how did that theater we've had, company wash you know, up? Or I have no idea. It was a, it was a, a theater run by the town. Oh, run by the town. Yeah. And that so I would have been, it down. was like a you community have, theater, but I would have been, the pr part of the professional Well, we staff are so running. fortunate that you came back oh, for Lenore. Know. Thank you, but, Lenore, for bringing <laughs> him back. But, and I'm glad I did come back, so. Now, another big thing that happened, I'm sure there are many wonderful things, but I'm sort of leading into, you started your own theater company here. Yeah, so Fly By Night Productions. Productions. Which is still in existence? Yes. So how many years most, Fly By Night? 30... Eight, Are you the oldest theater 82? company that's continuously running? Is, I can't think no, of anything no, that would... The, actually, you with your roots going back to the bar and community theater... Oh, right, in 71. ...was reestablished before us. Well, thank yeah. you for giving us credit for that. But, so, it feels uh, like. but yeah, it was, it was one of the... Uh, now you look at Dubuque and, and you think of all the different theater companies that are going in Dubuque, but it's hard to imagine at that time there was no other place for me to direct. Yeah. Because at the, the, the barn community theater, which was out at the park on the, right, the western the town, right, it was all the plays were directed by one individual. Uh, the fine arts players eventually, because of financial reasons, closed down to where they were just doing the one acts. So there wasn't those opportunities. And there weren't any other opportunities. So I just decided, okay. And what year did Fly By Night start? 82. 82. So uh, I was still in college. So. I yeah, would've... and uh, Lenore came home one day, and at that time, prior to, again, old man talk, prior to computers and everything. Are you, you could... married by now? No. 
Still not married. Okay. No. We had to wait and see if the theater company worked out. Oh. No. <laughs> not really. Uh, if you can work together, <laughs> you can be a... At, at that time, you could buy graphic art books at the store. And once you bought the book, you had the right to use all the graphic art things in the book to use to do programs or posters or whatever. And so I had a couple of those. And so she comes home one day, and we're living in sin. <gasps> oh, scandalous. We're leaving. We're getting married. We know we're getting married. That's fine. Uh, and, oops. Um, that was two. So she walks in the door, and I look at her and go, we're going to start a theater company. I've got a logo. <laughs> it's the first thing I said. I've got a logo. You said that or she did? I did. And you said we're starting a theater company yeah. or she did? Okay. I said we're starting a theater company. I got a logo and she just looked at me. So we started it in the basement of the Ruth and Russ Nash's old art gallery okay. on Loris Boulevard in their basement. The old romantic image of two people setting up at night at their dining room table with blank postcards going through the phone book, finding all the, anyone that name they recognized and writing out by hand all the invitations to come to our first show. Wow. Looking at the city council and finding all their addresses and writing them personal invitations and all done by hand. I feel like I should the, be doing that right now. <laughs> the cast, when they weren't what on stage. What was the first show? Uh, the first show was Pfeiffer's People. Okay. Was Lenore, were you directing? And was Lenore in it? I was, yeah, I was directing. Lenore was in it, and four of our other friends were in it. And the cast would sit when they weren't on stage or doing something on stage, because the cast was on stage most of the time. They would have markers and colored pencils, and we had the posters printed in black and white because that's we were we were paying out of our own pocket everything, and they would sit there and they'd have a master poster, <laughs> and they would all color in the poster to match the artwork. Lenore was an art major, so she had done basically images of everybody in the cast playing different characters in the show. And they would color it in based on this mask. So we'd have colored posters. And the first weekend, there were five in the show. I was running lights and sound on a homemade light board that we still have and still use to this day <laughs> with, with sliders you could buy in the hardware store and clip on lights for our yep. lights and everything. There was one show where one audience member showed up. And we had two ushers that night. So we were in three quarters of a setting. And so one audience, one usher and the audience, they sat in all three sections. So we still had to play to all three areas. Uh, and so the cast outnumbered the audience. And then the second weekend, we get to the first performance of that weekend, and we're turning people away. That one person must have liked it. I don't know. But and so the second weekend, we were turning people away. And it was just that. Is and so fantastic. we've been going ever since then. That so. is great. Well, I think the, when I moved back to Dubuque in 19, no, 2015, I think the first show I saw once I got back here was a fly by night show. I can't remember the number. Four thousand miles, one thousand miles, two thousand miles. Thousand miles. I think a thousand. I did. I, that's why by, by then. But Linda I Ressler was playing the ninety-year-old yeah. grandma, and I had never seen this, but I loved it. And yeah, that's I've when I. By that time, I, I in two thousand, I left. I had been artistic director up till then, and in two thousand, Lenore took over and became the artistic director of the company, and I went over to Loris. Because yes, we'll get that, into Loris okay, in a little bit. By that point, what happens is when you're, when you're out there, Fly By Night mainly performs during the winter months. We don't perform sure. in the summer. And so at that point in our lives, in the summer, I would take off because I was tired of Lenore. Oh! And it, no. <laughs> That's not true, honey. I will say, um, to toast you. Um, as two. For those of you out in stream... 
I guess Facebook Live land. Obviously, Lenore is sitting out in the audience. She's the only person out there yeah. other than our camera people and Tracy and Austin high up there. So she's it's just like your, it's just like your fly by night show. We have an audience of one. <laughs> But she's out there because I knew Frank would say um so much that I might be drunk. You just said it again. <laughs> and so it's always she's my good right, to she's play my right, into somebody. She's my right home. You're so lucky I have but no one we, to uh, drive me home. Uh-uh, there's no one. Hmm. Right, come on. So by that time, I had been going out during the summer to other gigs. And for example, two years... I was the production stage manager for Jack Daniels, da Jack Daniels' original silver cornet band out of Nashville, Tennessee, and it was a brass band supported Are by. Are you doing this, this remotely? Or no, I was out touring with them. Oh, okay. Are you married yet? Yes, we're married. Okay, finally. Now. We got married in Five Flags. I was just by the so way. concerned that we you were, did, you were we living did, in sin we, for so long. <laughs> We did our wedding like it was a play. We had play programs <laughs> for the audience. We had a mime perform. A mime? Mime, yeah. Okay. And everything, all my old theater friends came in and did things. And some, a friend of hers who was a folk singer in Chicago came and did, she was a professional musician, and came in and did the music. And it was like a play. And our, our, her parents were the granting organization and provided the grant for the production. Now, but I got to segue a little in here. Did you at some point work for Westerbeek Schools, or who did a that? Long, yeah, that was one of those gigs I was taking because I didn't have a permanent job. So I went out there and directed for them for a year. Okay, because I know my Uncle Tom and Aunt Brenda, my Uncle Tom was principal out at West Dubuque and all that, and he, my Aunt Brenda tells a story about meeting you and Lenore after you were married and okay, lenore and? kept her own name yes she did lenore howard and my she aunt did. brenda this was the first person first woman she'd ever met that kept her own <laughs> name after she was married this was not i think i think my aunt brenda was inspired by it not scandalized in any way but it was you know it was part we, of the we, age. that was a real tough decision for her we we talked about all the combinations you know, we talked about me taking her name. We talked about all the different combinations. Howard Donald, Donald Howard, and everything. And the person, and remarkably, we really haven't had that many problems with it legally or why anything. Think, no, why, why would you? The person that threw off the most was probably her mother. Not because of any moral judgment, but she never knew how to address the envelopes. <laughs> so it was like, for a while, every envelope we got would be Mr. Mrs. Howard Donald. And then the next would be Mr. and Mrs. Donald Howard. <laughs> or Mr. Well, that's nice for Mother to even she include you in the letter. Be, how should I address the envelopes? But yeah, I, I, I appreciated it because it, it, it said to me that I was marrying a strong woman. Well, I yes. mean, what attracted me to Lenore is that she, she's a very strong, talented, intelligent woman. And I find that very attractive. That's so. fantastic. So. And with that, we're going to... Ah! Shameless plugs! I didn't think it could get more dramatic, but I guess it can. <laughs> Fly by Night Productions will present a virtual Christmas play reading of Peace on Earth, Goodwill to Dogs on Friday, December 18th at 7 p.m. This little-known, family-friendly Christmas story takes place in a small New England town in 1906 and evokes feelings of a Dickens Christmas. For upcoming details, go to www.flybynightdebuke.com. So I put in a shameless plug for Fly By Night. Tell, do you know anything about this show? I've not heard of it. No. <laughs> you know nothing about the no. show? I'm intrigued no, by it because I love dogs. I, I know what I know. I hope that's is, not a typo. <laughs> what I know is that Lenore has been spending hours down in her office adapting the script. Uh, she spent hours tracing who controlled. Yes, it I did notice when I emailed and, both of you for a. Can you give me a shameless plug about fly? It was Lenore that responded. Yeah, she's she's fly my night now. Yes, absolutely. So. 
Okay, Doug, I'm going to put a little teaser out here, and I will ask you about the production you directed for the grand that opened our 2019-2020 season that was unfortunately cut short. I'm going to ask yes. you about that a little later, but first, I want to acknowledge, or at least have you acknowledge, I lost my place. This 7.5% is getting to me. That I have been trying to get. Well, you then, um! <laughs> that I have been trying to get you to direct here at the Grand for several years. I asked you multiple times before you finally said yes. No, or maybe I, you just. I, no, I don't know. No, I, I you always I said would sit, I would literally sit. You in my always basement. said you had other commitments. I would sit there going, what, Frank I think you like just me? didn't what, like what, me. What, I so, would cuddle up and just go into a fetal position, going, "Why?" Well, regardless why of what me? prevented what you that, from no, doing yes, it, yes, I will admit that yes, you had contacted. In me. 2018, there was a change in your life circumstances that gave you a little more free time and then the next time i asked you did say yes yes so what happened after 2018 that gave you a little more free time i retired you retired highly you, recommended you are far too way. young to retire you huh. didn't you retired from somewhere but you're still working yeah. so tell me what were you doing well we've kind of already talked about this you were at loris from right, when I to was, when i i had been teaching at loris since 1902 82. <laughs> yeah. Old man teaches 82. The old students. I did teach you since 1982 at Loris. Mainly theater courses, but also public speaking. And in 2000, Don Stribling finally retired as director of theater, and they offered it to me. At that point, Lenore and I had, had a, an absolutely fantastic daughter, Caitlin. She was little then, not totally fantastic yet. Grew up <laughs> to be fantastic eventually, through no fault of mine. Uh, oops. We've only got a six pack here, so we both <laughs> better slow down a little. There's a lot of show to go. And so I had thought at that time that I needed a little bit more steady income because going out and doing things like Jack Daniels sure. or directing somewhere else wasn't real steady. It wasn't a steady form of income. And so it gave us more security. Well, you so, seem to me like a natural teacher. You know, I, obviously I, you're a great I, I director. I've seen you both lot. direct. I've seen things you've directed. I've seen the things you've acted. And yeah. now I've seen the way you interact with actors. And it feels like uh, academia feels like a really natural fit for me, for you. So tell me about some of the stuff that you did at Loris. Like I, I saw... Well, one of your Shakespeare shows there. Uh, <laughs> obviously, I was only back in town for a few years while you were still directing and running the Loris program, but there were other features that you... What was the Yeah, as a matter of fact, Any two students? of the, two I know of the, the, in this show, we'll talk about that a little later, you have several students. Yeah. I'm always running into your former students. And, so and two of them it. here tonight, Stephen, although I don't claim him always, and Austin, both former students, students. And, and Tracy at one time was our technical director before you took him. But he was our technical director at Loris. It, I enjoyed teaching. I, I didn't enjoy, to be bluntly honest, I didn't enjoy all the all the other things you had to do surrounding teacher as far as the meetings and, and all the other things you had to do. But I loved the time I spent with the students. And you, did you have sort of complete artistic control of what yes, you would present? Yes, I, I will say I, I loved Loris because of that. They never once came to me and said, You can't, you do, can't that? do that. Well, or what are you doing or anything. They never, they always... There is, it, it, it is a Catholic school. Mm -hmm. There is a conservative element to the Catholic Church. And so once in a while I would get backsplash on some things we did in the theater. Post show. Yes. But the school always supported me in doing it. Well, that's terrific. And I so, did a show at Loris when I, I went to Clark. So I actually went to Clark the year after it went co ed. 
and primarily and because at that point they were still switching right back and forth some guys would well the clark loris singers were still in effect oh. they were it was still very much you know loris had been traditionally a men's school and clark mm -hmm. a women's school so they they did a lot of stuff yeah. together so we loris guys were allowed to audition at clark so and then when it became co-ed we got to audition at loris shows so i was able to do the pirates of penzance at loris and I got to play the Pirate King, and my good friend Chris Fitzpatrick got to play Frederick. So I was, we always thought this was so great that the two Clark boys got the leads in the Loris show. The rumor at Loris was that they felt sorry for Clark. Oh! <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I'm sure they did. No. But I also took classes. You know, they had the little bus that would run around. Uh -huh. So I know I took psychology at Loris. I took German at Loris. It was the best of both worlds you know mm -hmm. you had to you were able to look at the syllabuses of things and, and i took german because i was a vocal major at the time and thinking i'd want pronunciation See, we have so much I, I also i lived in germany when i was a young yeah really, really young probably with the military thing yeah we were in germany for two years so I when just, i came back i thought i would cheat and in high school i took german I thought my sophomore year in college we toured europe with the clark laura singers and one of my most indelible memories is that I got terribly sick and vomited all over the streets of Stuttgart. The, the only thing I really remember now, because I haven't spoken it for, wie oft bist du? Yeah, I don't know what that means. How old are you? I know, but der Mond steht über den Berge, which means the moon shines but, over the mountains, <laughs> so. which was the lyric of one of the Schubert songs I sang. So. So we talked about, anything else about Loris, you know, you want to say? I, I, I probably was lucky enough to do the production, one of the productions I'm most proud of. I did, I, I was lucky at Loris in that. I think they were lucky. Somehow, well, somehow, because I, I, I think directing well, yes, there's some skill and all, but some of it's luck. Because when you audition a show, and this is why when you watch a movie, a lot of times you see directors working with the same group of actors. Mm -hmm. is when you hold auditions, there are those actors you've worked with that you know what they can do, you know how willing they are to try new things. But then there's a, always those actors that try out that you've never worked with. And you don't know if what they're doing in audition is that's it. Right. That's all you're going to get is what you see at audition. Or if there's someone that... And I've had a, a number of students that, at auditions, they really to be on a suck. Ah! <laughs> but you cast them and you find out in the rehearsal process, they take off. That's very rewarding. You know, and they don't audition well. That's their weak point. And you don't know that when you audition. So, so much of what you do with a show as a director is in how you cast it. And so there's an element of luck. I totally and I agree. lucked out at Loris. And so we, one year we did in combination with fly-by-night productions. And I think at the time, from the research, we were maybe one of four to five companies in America that had ever tried it. And I felt really great when it was three or four years later that American Players Theater in Spring Green, Wisconsin, the, the theater I love to go see, tried it. So and that is, we then. did Hamlet in combination with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are oh, okay. dead. Same cast in both shows. Uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are two minor characters in Hamlet. Mm -hmm. And he writes a play about how the big events of Hamlet affect these two minor characters in his play. Tom Stoppard wrote it. And so we did it in combination. And I look back at it now and I sometimes think, how did we do that? Did you do them did... sequentially or were right. they in rep? We, we, well, we were, they were in rep. So on oh Friday my gosh, night, that's we a, would that's do a Hamlet, big heavy lift. And then Saturday night, we would do Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. And then Sunday afternoon, we'd do Hamlet. And Sunday night, you'd do Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Wow. Same costumes, same set. I worked it out so that, for example, in Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, there's a place where you see Hamlet, who's a minor character in that play, just walk through the scene. <laughs> but I duplicated all the blocking where they overlapped. 
So even though we just walked through, if you had seen Hamlet at first, you would sit there going, oh, he's doing the to be or not to be speech at that point, even though you didn't hear a word. Whereas if you saw the other one first, you would sit there watching him doing the to be or not to be speech, and then you would see Rosencrantz and Guildenstern kind of peek around the corner for a <laughs> second and disappear, and you'd go, oh, they're over there talking about this at that point. And it was just the whole coordination and the work was... So at well, you I really do have the them. heart of a director, and it seems like you, it came to you very early. It did. And very different than my... But a lot of that, a lot of that comes from my dad, I think. My, my impetus to become a director came from a very different place. I was working in opera okay. as a performer, and opera can be very staid mm -hmm. and sort of stand and sing, or it can be very dynamic. And there was a particular director that I found repulsive. And I thought, I can do better than that. <laughs> I'm going to try it. So my first directing experiences were, were in opera because I thought, I can do better what's th than what they're doing right now. That had in my head a much more happy and funnier tone to it and it got very kind of serious i don't mean i don't mean that i i really love directing and i moved there but i remember being a performer being so frustrated by a director that wasn't allowing us to oh. act these wonderful yeah. emotions that are in opera and opera can be dynamic and exciting as something or you can stand there and sing and sometimes there's nothing more appropriate than standing there and singing because the voice can tell the story. But mm -hmm. so we came I'm, to direct. I'm, I'm going to play the interviewer for a minute. Okay, please. First, do. I'm going to say um because we've gone too far without drinking. Have you found in your career in opera that the way of staging operas and doing operas has changed? It seems like to me it has changed over the years to become more dramatic and incorporate more acting and, and the way it stays. Have you found that? I that's... think definitely yes. And I think if you take opera back, you know, even decades farther than when I was in it, it was much more so. I think when I started directing opera, that revolution was already happening. Okay. But I also have come to appreciate the other side of it. I used to be very much a why would you ever cast that person to play so-and-so when they obviously can't be a teenage girl, you know, or look like a teenage girl? Whereas I, I directed Rigoletta one time, and Gilda is supposed to be an 18-year-old girl. And it's insanely hard to sing, and there is no possible way an 18-year-old girl could do it justice. And I got to direct a woman in her 50s who had a s lovely build, play Gilda, who I originally was sort of like, in opera, the director does not get a say in the casting. It's the conductor. Okay. It was like, I got to work with this 50 plus year old woman playing an eight year old girl. And she was brilliant. She was a you're in a much larger house and you're in a thing. And the way she moved her body, you believed she was a teenager and she produced it vocally. So it was great. So there I have come to appreciate both sides of the thing. The music sometimes demands a more mature voice than the character would be. And the musical experience is ultimately what it's about. But you don't have to sacrifice the drama and the movement and all that for no reason at all. Okay. Now, I apologize to the audience because I know we're getting into the director weeds here, but when I first started directing, I was that director that would cast the actor over the singer. Yeah. I remember when I did Of the I Sing, a very great political show mm -hmm. about politics by the Gershwins. Mm -hmm. And I was doing it at a community theater in Washington, Iowa. They had built a brand new community theater. I had the honor of directing the very first show they did in the community theater. And at that age, I was still at, it was at the beginning of my career, and I was still at the actor. I want the actor 
instead of the singer. But I think I realized over the years that in a musical, singing comes first in a lot of ways. There is a fine line, sometimes not so fine, sometimes it's really a broad line, between what to do. Because if somebody can't sing, you can't teach it to them no. in the rehearsal process. It's not going to work. Mm -hmm. So I have learned to trust musical directors and have them put actors through yeah. the paces of going, okay, is this somebody that can match pitch? Is this somebody that can take direction? Is this somebody that's going to be able to at least perform in the numbers? You know, and then when it comes down to it, if there's if there is an actor that can really sell a song and they don't have the mm -hmm. best voice, I'm probably going to go with the actor. But if there's an actor that really can't hold a tune, it's just going to ruin your and show. And the other thing I think usually is the audience wants the singer. Yeah. I think a lot. They'll, do, they'll choose the there's singer. There's a lot. If an actor that can really, you know, knows how to talk, yeah. sing, or knows, yeah. how to, knows how to put themselves in the best light can do wonders. But it's, it's a dicey thing. But boy, thing. when you get that actor that can do both. Oh, yeah. Or that actor that can do all three and move well. Yeah, then would... you're like, thank you. <laughs> exactly. Well, we're maybe running long here, so. Shameless plugs. That was excellent, Doug. It's getting really dramatic. Next time I'm going to want you, I'm going to be the director here. Give me a different tack. Give me a different uh, attack on it. You know. Okay. Can I have going. a moment to? No, you no. Do that's it? next time. Can I think about? We're going to move. Yeah, you're going to have a lot of time to because this is a think, long one. I'll, I'll the Grand Opera okay. House, in partnership with the Iowa Rock and Roll <sighs> Music Association, presents Maddie Poppy's Acoustic Christmas. Join the season 16 American Idol winner and Iowa native Maddie Poppy for an intimate night of music at the Grand Opera House. Since her idol victory, Maddie has been in high demand, appearing on multiple TV shows, including Jimmy Kimmel Live and Live with Kelly and Ryan, and performing at the Hollywood Bowl in Los Angeles, Special Olympics, and the CMA Fest in Nashville. And she's going to be here at the Grand. Maddie's new album, Christmas from Home, will be released on November 20th. That's like just in a couple days, right? Yeah. You can pre-save it now on Spotify. Pre-save something they kids <laughs> say right now. Due to social distance seating, an extremely limited number of seats will be available for our live audience, and they are going very fast. There are still some available, but if you want to see Mary, Maddie Poppy live in person here at the Grand, you better make your reservations now. Call the box office. We're only doing these reservations in person or over the phone so that we can assure socially distanced seating. Uh, box office hours are Monday through Friday, noon to 4 p.m., or by calling during those same hours, 563-588-1305. A live stream option will be available for this concert, and we're going to be releasing that information in a very short amount of time. For more information on this and other events, visit the Grand's webpage, www.thegrandoperahouse.com. You owe me a drink. Okay, sorry. Didn't, no, don't apologize. That's Never one of your things I've heard in rehearsal, just watching this. I guess you're a, a don't apologize guy. Yeah, I do that because... It is really I, embarrassing I, I, I when think... you do an um. <laughs> or an ah. Uh, while you're reading. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Let's talk about the production. <coughs> I did finally get to direct you to direct here at the Grand, which was? Murder on the Orient Express. Yes, and I love that it was Ken Ludwig's brand new adaptation mm -hmm. of it. It had never been adapted. You were, yeah, how, you were. I think we were the second or third second, theater yeah. in the country to do this. So it was really exciting that we were able to do it and everyone told me, you gotta get Doug to direct this, you gotta get Doug to direct this because you are the a, a Agatha Christie and a murder well, not a murder, I guess a mystery expert. Maybe I, you are I, a murder expert. I don't know, I don't know if I'm, maybe, but my wife's still here, so I guess not. <laughs> that was a joke. So let's talk a little bit so, about Murder on the Orient Express. Well, I, I love murder mysteries. First show I did at Loris. That's what I said. You're, yeah, it's was part of your, clue, one of your was passion. Was Clue the Musical. Oh. 
which has James. actually it has actually 218 different ways you can do the show because it starts with the audience choosing the cards oh from the weapons God. room and murder and then based on what cards they choose you have to adapt the show to fit those cards and then eventually i've, I've gone on and I've, I've done three agatha christie shows and there's just there's something about doing a murder mystery of trying to balance out the aspect of giving the hint to the audience but not hitting them over the head yeah. with it where they go ah it's so and so before you but yet at the end letting them go oh yes that does make sense but i didn't catch it didn't see it coming or yeah. then you rewatch it i love watching murder mysteries a second time to, <laughs> to get all that stuff. Oh, that, go, oh, yeah. oh, there's a clue. There's a clue I missed the first time. There's a clue I missed the first time. Well, we have some photos from oh, okay. Murder on the... So let's look at this so we can talk about it a little more in depth. So Austin, will you put up the first photo of Murder on the Orient Express? So here we have this. Tell me what's going on in this scene. Well, this is actually the exterior of the train. I was lucky enough that when you offered me the first show to work here, I got to work with Tracy again. Tracy and I have uh, some of my former students and people have accused us of being like a married couple <laughs> because sometimes we can really fight and really go at each other. But I think we do it because we both recognize we really care about the production. I am laughing because I'm recalling a particular production meeting <laughs> up in the office where you two did exactly go at each other like that. And I was so horrified. It's like, oh my God, they're gonna kill one another. And you just turned to me and said, it's okay. <laughs> this is the way we communicate. It's like, we okay. worked together. I mean, I've been lucky enough to, I love working with Tracy. But yeah, at times, but it's because we both so care about what we're doing. And yet I think we also know that we both can do that with each other. And yeah. then it'll be okay. We'll and it still will be go safe out. at the end. But you to know, an outside think, observer, it's you know, horrifying and frightening. But we kind of know, like, okay, it's okay. We'll go out afterwards and have a beer. We'll be okay. Yeah. And so this, uh, oh, oops, it was an uh, caught myself. So there, you're on the outside he of the train came up station. With it. it took us a while to work there. Because I can't imagine, and I, I know. Huge other, challenges to it this is, show. It is, because other people that had told me, like, God, I would never want to, to design this set. Because how do you design a moving train on stage? Right. And you have to have two scenes before you even get to right. the train. It's not and, like you just, and how do you do that? And then I'm sitting there thinking, how do I block a play on the, on the confining room of a train that's interesting? Where you're not just sitting there the whole scene. But that actually ultimately, and, and I so think, added first, to the drama of it. Right. That and so this first scene is the exterior of the train where, where the you're cast the is getting ready to board the train and get on the Orient Express. And it was, it was just so wonderful to try to figure out how to use this train and and how to create interesting images and movement. And now, I'm going to add in here. For some reason, I'm not, I think just because I'm the only person left, typically for shows, I get stuck doing sound effects. Not sound effects mm -hmm. like we do here, but sound cues, and I build them, and I really don't know what I'm doing. I'm just taking what I think should be, and I'm working very rudimentarily. Tracy yells at me all the time saying, you should have audacity, you shouldn't be doing this on your Mac, or whatever. <laughs> I love, you did everything. You knew what you wanted for sound. You created all of it. You did all that. You took all that off my plate, so thank you. Um, oh, um, you're welcome. I enjoy doing sound. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to this next photo. So now here we are in the interior of the train, and this right, is- Right, we're, we're in the dining car. The dining uh, car. Art this is Deco, beautiful. The, the Orient That's... Express at that time was an Art Deco, and I actually came in and there were times I actually regretted doing this. I volunteered <laughs> to help Tracy during the day because I'm retired. And so I could come in and help him during the day. So I got stuck with a, a jigsaw. Well, look at all that cutting out these work. Yeah, cutting these out. And I'm like, God, why did I volunteer for this? 
But it was such a brilliant design of capturing that feel of the Art Deco. Which is such and another challenge of creating both the set and then directing it is that right. you have to create this train and have one side open for the audience to see, mm -hmm. but yet how do you do that in train yeah. cars that have different functions and stuff? So, so and this is, uh, this is Ed Henry and Mike Link and Karen George. The, tr the, the train, I don't think the and audience it, really realized the complexity of because what it's long. Was up it, here. it can't just sit there. It has to move right. too. It, it not only moved down, moved forward, but it moved left and right. And so, in rehearsal, there's also the complication of between the train cars there were doors yeah. that had to open and close. And, and I was lucky enough to have Bridget for my stage manager. But we would sit there in rehearsal and we'd go. Doors. Yes, yeah, Bridget is a wonderful walk, stage and manager. And Isn't and she okay, Stephen? I have to close it. But trying to get the in the rehearsal where there's basically just tape on the floor, mm -hmm. and you would have a bench to represent this, and a couple of tables, a tape round table, which the tables weren't round, and a couple of chairs to represent this. Uh, trying to get the actors in the rehearsal space to realize what they were going to come into when they came on the actual set. Right, which you don't get a lot of time. Right, you don't, you get a week. A uh, week and a half in this case. But I was lucky enough that it was a, like Ed and Mike and, and Karen, they, they were this great cast that was willing to try things, that listened, that focused, that worked. And it was just a, a overall a, an absolutely wonderful experience as a director. Well, let's go on to the next photo here. And this one shows a much more complex thing because here we're, it's one of the sleeping cars and we're right. divided into three separate. Right, and, and the hard part here is that you look and at- And there's a hallway behind it. Right, you see, you see first Ed Henry, who's Perot, the detective. Mm -hmm. And then you see Joe Blake, who's who's actually ends up being, he had what I think in some ways is the hardest role in some ways, yes. because eventually he gets killed. It's okay. We're not going to do it for another thirty years. Yeah. So you can tell what. <laughs> Sorry, at the end. well, we know he gets killed. The the mystery is who he, who killed him. But then, so for the second half of the show, he has to, because in the original production they used a <laughs> you dummy. You were so cruel. <laughs> they used a dummy. But at the very end, the last scene of the show where the murderers are acting out the murder, I wanted him to be able to move. Right. Just with this little thing. So in other it. productions, they put a dummy in right. there for this whole second but act. I you made him, Joe just lie there dead. Right. I wanted him to be able, as they were stabbing him, to do a little movement as they were stabbing him. And so Joe had to lay there without moving the whole second act. And not fall asleep. Right. He did And so, but this was because eventually, if you look at these little three compartments, eventually you get into a scene where you've got every character has <laughs> to be in there. And it's like, how do you do that? Let's move to the next so photo, you can which see sort of shows that. You know, so Tracy so in had, the next photo, they're all out in the right, hallway there, right. but they're going to so, have to come in this car. There were rehearsals where once we, especially once we got on the set, where I would have to go, no, you need to be six inches over this way. You have to be perfectly in this opening at this point. Yeah. And there was one point we called the chase, where they're all running through the train. And I, I love the cast because I came in, I think it was four days before we opened. We were in almost in the tech rehearsals, and I looked at them and go, "We're reblocking this." Oh, the fine! I do remember that. And so we took the first twenty minutes and we reblocked the chase through the train where they all had to run and then stop perfectly in the middle of these openings to be seen. I do and recall just, that because this is one yeah. of the shows I am occasionally called on to be part of the technical crew if we need people, and this one needed a lot of bodies to push the train forward mm -hmm. and to move it from side to side. And I recall, so I was backstage when that happened. 
Yeah, and 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 I loved I loved the cast because they were perfectly willing to do it. They were like, okay. And so this is a, this, again the three sleeping cars. You can see Joe's laying in his bed. You see his feet and things there. And, but they're all very conscientiously being in the they different. They are. Openings. Every single one of them is in their appropriate right. little where, window where, that Tracy gave us to be able to be seen by the audience. That so. is terrific. Well, it was it was a great show, and I'm so thrilled. It was a fun we, show to do. It we got you to finally direct was. here, or with had you directed at the Grand before that? Or no, no. Okay, so it was your premiere, no. and now in I had come in, week. and on a couple of occasions, I had helped Tracy. I had built a couple of windows up in the uh, the side, the wings of the stage for Spamalot, and you all did Spamalot. Oh, that was the first show that happened after yeah. I got. There. I came in and I decorated the little house. I did the curtains and the windows <laughs> and stuff in that little house that had to travel. But I came in a couple of times and I'd helped him out when he needed help. So. But well, I'd never directed for the Grand before. Well, I am so thrilled you're here and that you're doing another one, and we hope it is just one of many that will come. But it is. Shame. Less blows. Very different emotion, just what I asked for. So I try to follow directions. Now we're going into... The shameless plug for what we're actually here to promote, finally. So I think Austin's going to put a picture of our promo shot up. Doo, doo, doo. The Grand Opera House will prevent, present KGOH, The Voice of the Grand Presents Christmas Treasures, a radio play directed and adapted for the stage by Doug Donald. Performances on November 27th, 28th at 7.30 p.m. and November 29th at 2 p.m. Set in the 1940s, set in a 1940s radio station, actors and sound effects artists come together to bring to life three classic Christmas stories, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, A Child's Christmas in Wales, and A Christmas Carol. The cast is comprised of a small number of actors voicing all the characters, plus live sound effects artists, and Terry Dillon on keyboards, who will provide live musical accompaniment and underscoring. The production will pre be presented to a socially distanced live audience and live streamed for tickets and details to get res reservations to be part of the live audience or access to the live stream visit the grand's website at www.thegrandoperahouse.com you didn't say any but i need a drink so i'm going to say um um and I'm going to have to get another beer out of there. You're always just a little ahead of me. Sheesh. Got to be ahead of you, Doug. That's, <laughs> it's hard to be. It's one of the few things. So in any case, let's move on. Okay. We have finally made it to the show that we're actually here finally. to promote. Okay. So tell me about Christmas Treasures. Well, you had contacted me, and you were. Tr my understanding is you were trying to figure out. A, right. A what do we do show? something safely during yeah. this COVID age? And a, a radio play felt like. A way to do that right because you can this if you can see behind right us, we are actually right now the, on the, the set mics. of christmas treasure it's going to be more right. i mean we'll decorate it a little bit up but basically but it's just easier sit. to place the actors spaced at the mics right and then they'll so be on so, two levels and and so i had done originally fly by night got me involved in radio shows we were approached by WDBQ, a local radio station here in town, and I believe, don't quote me on this, their 75th anniversary. I think their 75th. And they were doing a big thing of live broadcasts from their station here in town. And so they approached Fly By Night and said, would you like to do a live radio show Ooh. during that day that we're celebrating it. So I and a, a, a guy who was attached little, with uh, us at the t time, Paul Knupp, wrote a, an original soap opera based in Dubuque. And then I went off and tried to, uh, I, I'm not a musician, tried to come up with original music that could be performed and the live sound <laughs> effects 
And we went out to WDBQ and performed it live on the air. And that got me associated with radio shows. And then eventually Fly By Night started doing a lot of the old. We did Fibber McGee and Molly and The Lone Ranger and Space X and all the old radio shows. Because the great thing about radio is when they were doing it live, mainly in the 30s and 40s, was the highlight of live radio. Because they were doing it so quickly and putting it out so quickly, they never copyrighted the scripts. Oh, okay. And so you can do their scripts and you don't have to worry about because they never copyrighted them. And most of the time, you can't find the scripts. I would literally sit there in our house with, at that, that time, showing my age again, cassette player, mm. and I would play a line from the actual radio broadcast, and then I would type it. And then I would play another line and type it. You have to transcribe from the actual broadcast because there aren't printed there scripts. Are and so we started doing it. And then eventually when I got hired at Loris, we started doing it because it's a wonderful acting exercise. Well, this is the amazing thing. When I approached you about doing this, you said, oh, I knew that you had lots of experience. And you said, oh, yeah, we did these. I don't know whether it was every year at Loris. Yeah, every, multiple year, year, we every did. year at Loris. But you did them with one rehearsal. Yeah, that's what And then did. you did it. It's like, which horrifies me. Yeah, which actually sitting here working on this one now because we have, I think, six rehearsals yes. for this one. Last night when Lenore and I were, was going home, I sat there and I said, I don't understand. I don't know how we did this in one <laughs> rehearsal. But that's what they did. They did it. Yeah. Basically, they would well, get together. Well, you said at, at Loris, it was like performance plus teaching exercise. Right. Okay, this is the way you got to so do it. I wanted to understand how they did it. Right. And so they would, get to, they would rehearse one time. And then the same, same day, they would then do a live broadcast, have about an hour off, and then do a second live broadcast for the West Coast. Oh, yeah. So one live broadcast was for the East Coast, and one was for the West Coast. And they would rehearse once. And a lot of times at the one rehearsal, they wouldn't have all the cast there. For example, Orson Welles, who did probably the most famous radio broadcast that ever happened, War of the Worlds. He was one of the more active radio people. Was it he the was Mercury in, Radio Theater? Right, or something? Mercury Radio Theater. He was at one time in, I think, three to four different radio shows. He played The Lone Ranger. As a recurring he character. He played uh, Matt Dillon in Gunsmoke. Oh, well, example. it was on the radio. I didn't right. realize it was a radio show before it was a TV show. Yeah, so, but he played that character, but he was on a number of different broadcasts. And at one time, he hired an ambulance huh. so he could get from one studio to the next studio to do what he had to do oh in a given day. Until the city said, basically, you can't do that. <laughs> you can't use an ambulance for private transportation even if you have to be on the air yeah so they would rehearse sometimes and like for example he couldn't be there to the rehearsal so they would have stand-ins at the rehearsal and then he would come running in for the actual live broadcast and the actor who has stood in would hand him the script and go old Irishman <laughs> and walk out and that's so he all. hadn't even read the script? No, he hadn't even read it. And all he had to go by was, it's an old Irishman. And he would do it live based on that. And it was just a chaotic, they didn't take time to produce their scripts, which is why a lot of times you have to transcribe them from the actual mm -hmm. broadcast. And it was just a wonderful, and at that time, in the 30s and 40s, it was really the entertainment for america yeah a and i think even today you can still hear you don't hear so much now with like for example prairie home companion right but here in town bill's walk does a live radio old time radio on and bill Sunday i talked to bill today he okay. he's, i gave him your phone number because okay. he's going to call you 
and talk about this, and then he's going to hype the show on his show. Oh, okay. He does a lot Sunday evenings. Yes. He plays old-time radio. Yeah. And I think the, the reason I got drawn into it, not just because of what it does for actors teaching you, because you're really focused on what you can do vocally, because you don't have anything else. Because in radio, you didn't see mm -hmm. most times. You would do a lot like we're doing, the company that came into the Grand that would do live radio shows that came to the Grand at times before an audience. But for most of the people, it was just the sound. Right. And so as an actor, it forces you to think about what you're doing vocally. And, and how for you're this using production, with a small company, of actors telling three different stories. Everybody has to voice multiple different yes. characters. And then we have two sound effects artists that create mm -hmm. all the sound effects right. live on stage, plus Terry, who's gonna be doing some musical things, but that's leading me into live sound effects. And you are going to give us a little demonstration oh, okay. of how they work. Okay, I'm gonna move. I'm gonna oh. say, ah, so I can get a drink before I do this. I'm going this, oh, you said, ah, sheesh. Say, so Doug is now moving over to okay. the sound effects area, and he's going to when, demonstrate how some of these work. When I first started doing sound effects, there really aren't a lot of records on how they created the different sound effects. Because again, they were flying from show to show to show. We tend to think that they did it, we want to think they did it recorded-wise beforehand. Right. They didn't. They originally started using records at first. But they found they didn't have enough control. Oh yeah, you can't do the timing. Over the sound. And so they started doing them live. So the first sound effect artists were percussionists from bands because they had the bells and the whistles. Good with rhythm and timing. Right, and the different things that made noises. But some of them I look at and I think, how did they come up with that? For example, my favorite is this. This is a box of cornstarch. And I have no idea in all the research I've done who did it, how they came up with it, or why they even came up with it. But I'm going to try to hold this up to my mic and just listen for a second and think of someone walking in the snow. <laughs> When I first read that in the book. And cornstarch works, but cornflakes don't. I was, was going to say, when I first read that, I went to the grocery store and people stared at me. But as you know, in theater, you, whether people are staring at you or not, you do it. Right. So I took a box of cornstarch and they. <laughs> and I went, yes, that sounds like someone walking in snow. And I went around and I started squeezing sugar and flour. And they didn't work. Nothing makes a noise like this. But who thought of that? You know, so there are so, just so many. For example, this is bubble wrap, which we use now. Back in the day, they would have used cellophane. But if I do this, just think of a fire burning in a fireplace. Now, you probably can't hear it. But no, I can kind of hear it, yeah. But just all the different sounds. And and of course, in our show, these will be, we'll all have microphones on them. Right, so they will have microphones on them so the audience can hear them. But just a technique for when you do shoes, what they would do is they would hang them around their neck. But the technique of it's not just hitting, right, but it's realizing that, no, when you walk, you go heel, the toe. And so just the skill, when I would do radio, I usually find most of the actors, we're not doing it in this one because of COVID, so that the sound effects people only control certain sound effects and they do it and no one else does. But when I would do them at Loris, the actors, they would want to come and play, for example, with the piano sound. So this board. is a very special, tell, tell yeah, us, this, this we was, borrowed from, I this from Laura. Tracy, at that time, Tracy was still technical director at Laura's. 
And we used to get the old pianos from the music program. When they would buy new pianos, we would get the old ones in the theater. And so I looked at him one day and I said, I want to tear a piano apart. And this is actually it. And it was remarkable at how well pianos are made. <laughs> it took us forever to tear it apart. And this is the soundboard from a piano. But you can do such wonderful Creepy. But it makes such wonderful haunting sounds. Yeah, it just keeps reverberating. Yeah, and, and we, it, it works so well for A Christmas Carol, which is one of the shows we're doing. And it's just a wonderful place to play. And all the actors usually want to come over and go, oh, let me try it. Which unfortunately in this yeah. show, they can't do. But. So we do have two very right. specific mm -hmm. performers dedicated to doing the sound effects and then they each have their own stuff and it's just been fascinating to watch even just in the three rehearsals we've had so far how yeah. far it's come. It was just yeah. last night you know it's like doing running through a Christmas carol it's like and you'd given your notes beforehand and told them what to do and then it's like it's it's really exciting to watch come to I have no idea how you ever did it in one night, but <laughs> it's really great. Uh, can you show us how to do the wind machine oh, and maybe yes, the door slam? Yes. Just a couple of things and then we'll get back to drinking. This is a wind machine. Uh, I built this actually 36 years ago. My gosh. So it's been around for a while. But it's That's just been the a old lot way. of years you've been holding in that wind. It's the old way they used to create wind. But it's basically just wood slabs. And you built on that? Canvas, huh? You built that? Yeah. I didn't know yeah. that I'm learning something new. Yeah, and, and it's one of those machines. We, I actually was doing a show one year where the actor turned it the wrong way this way. Oh, it doesn't which work. Which basically just takes the canvas off of, <laughs> and it quits making sound. So. Now, do the little Please. door thing. I love that. Oh, this is a door I built, same time from this, but it's just. So you can do all that. And you can make the sound of the lock. Of the lock and all of this. OK, one more and then I'll say we, I love the train whistle. Oh, you do yes. The train this, whistle and then you can sit down. This actually belongs to the grand. This oh, it is does? One of your oh, I didn't know that. Sound effects. I have one you blow on, but this is one you had. So it's a train whistle. That is so perfect. That's magnificent. Okay. Thank you so much for that oh, wonderful, wonderful demonstration. Well, the great thing of, I think about radio, what drew me into it was it's so individualized. And, and the fact that when you're listening to the show, you're hearing the sounds, you're hearing the cast, but basically, for example, we're doing Christmas Carol, how you see Scrooge's office uh -huh. is your version. It's Frank's version of the office. How do you see the furniture? How do you see the color on the walls? How do you see Scrooge? How does he look? We give you the sound of Scrooge, but the visual is all up to you. So it's your Scrooge. It's my Scrooge. It's that person sitting in the audience it's their screw. So what you're saying is on radio, I could still play Curly in Oklahoma. You could. There was, there was, you could. I could still play. Although I, 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 that was one of those roles where I thought, God, I suck at this. Uh, but yeah, you would. Oh, I did an um. And then you said it. So that's two. Oh, my gosh. I'm glad I brought one more tonight. Oh, no, it's the last one. Have you got... I uh, know I'm, okay. I'm fine. You go okay. ahead. We're, we're close to wrapping up here. So but the, the great thing is an old radio, for example, Tonto in the Lone Ranger, when they were doing the radio broadcast, he was a 70 year old guy by the time they did the radio broadcast. You would never buy that 
looking at him. It was very common for women to play boys. You would often have a 30-year-old pregnant woman playing a teenager. That still happens, doesn't... Isn't the person... I never watched The Simpsons, but who's the kid Simpson? Doesn't a woman Mark? voice that? Mark? Yeah, doesn't a woman voice Bart? I think, yeah. Yeah, I think it's Julie. She was like, wrote a sister on Maud or something. Yeah. But yeah, sorry, but I you didn't, you didn't mind, because even when... They performed a number of shows in the studio. For example, War of the Worlds, mm -hmm. Mercury Theater's War of the Worlds, Orson Welles, was done in the studio. So they, they didn't have an audience. But a lot of shows performed in front of an audience. So you could see things, and they would, from time to time, do So something. there was a visual element right. to it as well for would, the live they audience. Would embrace and that's that really what we're recreating here. Right. Because we're doing it for both a live audience and a live stream audience. So they'll get to see the actors. Yes. For example. See which actor is voicing Scrooge and then voicing yeah. something else. Who's playing Rudolph and also having to play something right. else. And, and, and watching the see, sound effects people do. You get to see, for example, when they're walking through snow, you see someone squeezing the cornstarch. And, and you get to see how the winds created live. But you also get to th see things like with the actors. If you look behind me, there's a tube. I'm going to move. Sorry. I'm moving. Heads we, up. This is not approved. This I'm is moving. not pre approved. This isn't approved. I'm moving. I'll move slow. Doug, I'll turn maybe it off sideways. camera now. I don't know. Okay. I don't know if that shows or not. That's actually for the actor. So the after talks in one end, it's actually Marley in The Christmas Carol, talks in one end and the other end is at the mic. So this is before we had sound equipment. That See, I didn't know, it's you. just sitting up there. I thought, what, what do we got a telescope no. on stage for? And so what it does is it creates the re, what we recognize as reverb, the constant echoing, and it, makes the voice very mysterious. And so they would vocally use things like that, which we're using in this show, ways of creating effects on the voice that you're not manipulating it through the electronic soundboard, but you're creating it live on stage. And so you get to watch and see all that and see how it's done and enjoy that aspect. Well, of it. I have really been enjoying watching you put it all together. We've got three more rehearsals and then three performances. The show opens the day after Thanksgiving, so I encourage you out there if please come part of be part of our socially distanced live audience or uh, purchase access to the live stream. It's going to be a great memory-filled experience. I'm really looking forward to watching it all come together. Before I wrap up here, I keep forgetting. We, we thought we'd talk about this and it never came up, but I haven't seen Doug without his mask in months. So he finally took his mask off to put his microphone on here and he's got this big mustache on. And I go, oh my gosh, now I've seen it. You, you have, that's your Mark Twain mustache, and that's something you have been doing regularly is features. So tell us about Mark Twain and the, the little Mark Twain videos you've been doing that are, are so yeah, wonderful. I, and they're still accessible, right? We can still watch those, yeah. correct? Uh, when the pandemic hit, I was like every other performing artist. The, the art industry, the performing artist industry has I'm been I'm just going to start drinking right now because Doug okay. does not say um or ah uh, nearly enough. Well, I would, we'll drink to, for the fun of it. Go ahead. The, the, the industry has been hit very hard. Yes. You know that. Everybody here knows it. We were one of the first industries to shut down. Yep. We're going to be one of the last ones to reestablish. Mm -hmm. There are millions of people in the entertainment industry out of work right right now and so i was like everybody else mark that that shutdown hit and you're like what do i do i can't do what i love doing i can't be with my community and it I, is so I, I, different than every other tragedy that has happened 
artists are typically the first ones to rush in yes. and go, okay, we're going to put on a benefit. We're going to do what we can to help. And this one, by its very nature, we can't do that. No. We're not allowed. That, that's the last thing we it, I know. Yeah. yeah, you're right. Everybody feels isolated. Everybody feels, but you found a creative you, outlet. And, and, and it's like you, you want to connect with your audience. So you try finding the, the virtual ways, the ways of your doing, of streaming, of connecting. But it's not the same with that personal, that person right. out here. Yeah. And so I was looking for what can I do? What, what can I fill it with? And so I had been doing Twain for years and since I was in Hannibal, Missouri at the ISOS Theater. Originally I didn't do Twain, I was... That really did wrap it back around to the beginning. So, good for you. Good. <laughs> and so in March I started doing what I called Twain shorts. And they're just little short five to ten minute sections of things Twain has written uh, some of them comedic, some of them not comedic. For example, the one, the one now I'm, I'm doing is kind of based on what's going on election-wise, not taking sides or anything, but he wrote a piece called Running for Governor. Mm -hmm. And it's based on him running for the governor of New York. Did he actually do that? No. Okay. It's just fiction. But it's all about these things the opponent starts putting out about him. Oh, okay. uh, and it ends up with him burning down an insane asylum with all the inmates because it obstructed the view from his house. Oh. And then it ends up with all these kids of all colors and raggedness being taught to rush up onto the platform and clasp him by the leg and call him father. And it's just based on the opposition, no matter what side you're on, of going after the other side. And it's done comedically. But you just sit there and you think, wow, this was written over a hundred years ago, but it still fits perfectly yeah. into our world. And so I started doing them. I've done approximately 30 of them. And where can we find them online if we want to uh, go back They're actually watch? on my Facebook page at the moment, uh, Doug Donald. I'm going to be uploading them. I'm lucky like you, Austin, who's my former student, uh, came to my house one night and we sat there in our masks and sat on opposite sides of the table and he showed me how to add titles and everything. So I, I'm a live theater person. I'm a technical idiot. I know what you, you mean. Know, I'm a live Thank theater God person. for you guys out there. I love so. you. I appreciate you. We get to sit here and have yeah. fun and do this and let them do the work. Right. They're exactly. working right now. We're not. So uh, I've done about 30, some of them humorous, some of them not. Uh, I'm getting ready. The one I'm doing, the one running for governor, and then I'm preparing one he did on Christmas. Oh. Uh, in his house. I'm going to do that one for the Christmas season. Uh, but they're just, they can be things like, my, one of my favorite pieces is one he wrote on uh, Jefferson and her glass eye. And it's this woman who had to use, she had to borrow a glass eye uh, to use. And uh, just all the, uh, all the things that would happen with this glass eye that didn't really fit and and she was always dropping it out. She'd try to pack it in with raw cotton, but that wouldn't work, and sometimes the cotton would stick out. Okay, I'm so feeling like this one we're going to have to listen to to completely yeah, and, and understand so it. Yeah, they're out there. Because so, yeah. it feels like, I don't know, what, what the hell is he talking but about? But I'm, like I'm like every other artist out there. How do, you, how do you still feed that creative impulse in well, this climate? You know, so we so greatly appreciate that one of the other reasons why we choose to chose to do a radio play is that we could do it in an abbreviated rehearsal fashion, not mm -hmm. the one night you do. <laughs> you know, we gave ourselves six nights, but Five it also so, but our actors are all socially distanced up to this point. They've all been wearing masks, which is different, isn't it? I mean, it is. Know, we have all these actors that, for example, we're doing Rudolph the Red Nose Reindeer. Right. So they're doing all these elf voices and reindeer voices. 
but they're wearing these masks. And you can't see their faces. But no. that's just the way it would be in radio. Yes, it would. But you pointed at me. That wasn't a point point, was it? No, it wasn't a point okay. point. So, but you sit there with masks on, and I sit there, and I think, wow, I can't wait to hear them when they don't have the masks on. So, And we won't, so, we're not going to do that until we get them actually standing right, in front of their things where they're out. properly socially distanced. Right, so we've sat one thing we are really attempting to do, we're making our theater as safe as possible for our audience member and for our performance performers and for our technical when, people when you called me because uh, i i will admit to everybody I, I i don't hide this at all i have a compromised lung system and so when you called me about coming and doing this i had to think about it for a little bit because i'm obviously obviously of the age <laughs> yes and then with Once the you compromised, get into your mid-40s, you got to worry. System, with the compromised lungs, I thought about it. And, and I, I, after all the years of working with Tracy, I know him well enough mm -hmm. that he has sat there and looked at everything. Right. You know. And so part of us, yes, the desire, I want to get back to this community. But we want to do it safely. Right. And, and that's why I said yes, because I knew that would happen here. Yes, it's frustrating being in a rehearsal wearing a mask. You want to take it off, and I want to use my voice. And, and as we've talked to the know, cast, so. you know, it's like, like we've said, one of the great things about being part of a cast is making that family and doing that social connections. And we've been talked to them and said, so, okay, I'm sorry, during your breaks, you can't all cluster together and talk to each other. So. We're making sacrifices to make sure we can present this safely, but I still think it's been wonderful to be an observer. I'll, I'll let a little uh, secret out. You know, we know that because of COVID, somebody, if they become exposed, even exposed to the virus, not even get it, it's like we've made provisions. Okay, if you have yeah. a symptom, if you're, you're, you're out. We're right. going to do you're, it. You're one, so you, we don't you, normally have understudies, but no, you are one of the understudies. I'm sitting my, my in. Wife. I'm watching every rehearsal right. as the male understudy, and we have and my wife Lenore the as the understudy. female understudy. So we've been sitting um, out in the house watching everything, and, taking and scrupulous notes, and just praying nobody gets exposed because we're going to have to go on. Unfortunately, we've already had it happen. Right on the very first even... day, the very first day of rehearsal, right. we had someone that called and said she she does not have COVID, but she was concerned because someone in her workplace right. did. Right. So we made the decision that, okay, we are going to, right. out she of was, an abundance was, of caution, we're going to replace you. And we will not hesitate to continue yeah, to do that. Because I mean, that's what's the most she's important She's one of those about. actors that I love. I've worked with her before. She was in Murder on mm -hmm. the Orient Express. I've worked with her in Fly by Night. I love working with her. And for me, it was really a heartbreak to lose her. Yeah, and even but for her. Was, but it was that safety issue of she didn't know at that point if she would really, if she had really been around the person or not. And if you go by the technical rules of what you should be doing, she yeah. hadn't been. So we're no. we're go but playing her and safely, but going we've been for going the above safe and side. beyond. Right. What is not just legal, but what is safe and responsible? Yes. And that's our that's our goal. Yeah. Which well, enables us, I would just add that it enables us, selfishly, on my part, <laughs> it enables us to do what we love and hopefully share that with all the people out there. Ah, so, you are right. So uh, I'll go with that ah uh, and take it as a... It has been wonderful spending time and drinking with you, Doug. Before we go, though, you have to earn your keep, so we're going to flip things around. You're going to point at me, and I'm going to give my best acting rendition of It's yeah. Time for Shameless Plugs, and then you're going to read the shameless okay. plug. So I'm ready. Okay. Okay. You have Oh, I didn't just, realize he was going to direct me. You have just received the absolute most positive news you have ever heard in your life. But it is time for shameless.
Plugs! Plugs! <laughs> How was that? We'll call you. Oh! Do your reading. <coughs> and this better raise us some money. The Grand Opera House is a 501c3 organization. This is going to take a while. And now, more than ever, we <laughs> have your support. Please consider donating to the Grand. You can make a one time or reoccurring donation by visiting the Grand's website www.thegrandoperahouse.com I think we're going to have to have our own weekly show and call it Overacting with Doug and Frank. That was magnificent. Doug, thank you for being my guest on Thank you. Um with Frank, it has been great spending time and drinking with you on the set here of <laughs> Christmas Treasures. We are going to see a lot of each other in the coming week. I just want to thank you for being such a great partner on this project. I'm really looking forward to watching it all come together and then be presented for both our live and virtual audience, as it would be in radio days, you know. Yeah. We would have had a live, and we would have had a virtual audience mm -hmm. in real radio days. So I think that's great. Yeah, no. And I really want an extra special thank you for bringing the beer. <laughs> it has been delightful drinking this Christmas ale, Scotch ale, that is not expired. Fresh but beer. But I am. I am Who expired, knew it could so. be so good? Next Thursday, oh my God, I can't believe, next Thursday is Thanksgiving. So we will not be having um oh. I don't even with know if Frank I be seen right now, but unless I start anyway. day drinking and decide to interview my turkey, which I'll be eating home alone. But we will be back on December third, and in the meantime, I invite you to stay on top of not you, uh, audience, <laughs> you two, stay on top of everything that's happening here at the Grand by visiting the Grand On Demand webpage on our website, www.thegrandoperahouse.com. Doug, I'm going to give you 10 seconds for any final thoughts, and then we got to sign off, because it's thank probably about midnight now. Thank you for inviting me. Happy holidays to everybody. I hope you join us for a wonderful time at Christmas Treasures. Stay safe, good night, and um... um.